go step by step. So now what are the complications that can be seen in patients who had a stroke? Now, most of these complications can be seen in any patient who is bedridden, who is not ambulatory. So the first one is a deep venous thrombosis. Now, deep venous thrombosis, as we know, is the coagulation of a lot of blood in the deep veins of our lower limbs. So if a person is not ambulatory, and generally we say that if a person is not ambulatory for three days, they have a very risk, high risk of developing deep venous thrombosis. Deep venous thrombosis can be life-threatening because if the thrombus goes from the veins to the lungs, it can be life-threatening and it can be very difficult to manage. Second is the pressure source. People who are not able to change position regularly, whose body parts are always in contact with a certain surface, they always have the risk of developing pressure source on the pressure points. So depending upon the position of our body, there are various pressure points. If we line spine position, the pressure points are the occiput, the shoulder blades, the gluteal region, the sacral region, the heels, and the popliteal region. If we lie on the side, the pressure points are our shoulder, the elbows, the area around the greater trochanter, the knees, and the lateral malleolus. So pressure source are very easy to form, but it becomes very difficult to manage them once they start. Second thing is, it's very easy for the pressure source to progress. We have seen pressure source progressing from grade one to grade three within a span of four to five days. So the best management of pressure source is prevention of their occurrence. So how do we then, is the lower respiratory tract infection? Again, patients who are not able to mobilize secretions of, from the lungs, they always have a high risk of developing respiratory tract infections. UTI or urinary tract infections is very common in stroke patients because in, most of the times they are on a indwelling catheter and sometimes because of the poor perineal hygiene, there is a high, always a high risk of of developing UTI. Then we have spasticity and contractures. Spasticity is generally defined as the increased tone in a group of muscle, which depends upon the velocity of the movement and the degree of movement. So spasticity is very common in stroke and we will discuss that generally in the upper limb, we see a flexor synergy pattern and in the lower limbs, we see a extensor synergy pattern. When we speak of flexor synergy pattern, it means that all the flexor muscles of the upper limbs are in flexor, uh, are spastic. And we, when we speak of extensor synergy pattern in the lower limb, that means the extensor muscles of the lower limbs of all the joints are in spastic state. Due to which stroke patients have a typical appearance for the, if they have the upper and lower limb synergy pattern. Again, if spasticity is not controlled, is not taken care of, that can lead to contractures of the joints which might not be treatable conservatively and then which can lead to deformity. So again, as I said, the best way to prevent spasticity is, is managed spasticity is, is prevention. So how do we treat this complication? So we go one by one, deep venous thrombosis. As I already said that the most common cause of deep venous thrombosis is non-ambulation or reduced movement in the lower limbs of our body. So for prevention of deep venous thrombosis, there are certain need, things that need that needs to be followed, like using a pressure store, uh, stockings or a sequential compression device. Then we then we have injections, low molecular heparin injections or inoxaparin, which are given to patients once daily for the prevention of deep venous thrombosis. Again, early mobilization of the joints helps in proper pumping of the blood from the lower limbs and helps in deep venous thrombosis. If the deep venous thrombosis occurs, it should be managed like an emergency. The patients are generally monitored very carefully for any change in their respiratory pattern or saturation. Inoxiparin is given the twice a day and it should be kept in mind that we should never use the sequential compression device in a patient who have deep venous thrombosis. We can use a compression stockings. Now we have the, so, and generally it is said that if a patient who has been on bed for 72 hours, these preventive measures have not been started, it's always better to go for a Doppler of the lower limbs so as to 
rule out deep venous thrombosis. Deep venous thrombosis should always be suspected in a patient if we see that there is swelling, pain, and warm lower limbs, which is very tender. And so in those cases, we have to suspect deep venous thrombosis. Then there is pressure source. As I mentioned, it is very easy for the pressure source to start, but it's very extremely difficult for them to heal. So pressure source are graded on a scale of one to five. And accordingly, we have to manage pressure source. The best way to prevent pressure source is changing the position of the patients every second hours. First, second thing, making sure that the perineal hygiene is properly maintained so that the skin doesn't remain moist for most of the time. In stroke patients, we have seen that the most of the time the patients are kept in supine position or a propped up position. So the sacral region is the most common area where the pressure sores are formed. So changing the position of the pressure uh, patients every second hourly, making sure that the skin doesn't remain moist for a long time, using of air mattress, water mattress, or nowadays ripple mattress are available, which consists which constantly changes the pressure points of the patients. Those should be used. Now, again, when, the patient, when we speak about changing the position of the patient, most of the time the patients are either in supine lying position or lateral position. When lying in lateral position for a long time, we have seen that sometimes the pressure source might be formed on the shoulder region and the elbows and knees, so and the greater trochanter region. So it is said that the patient should be lying in 30 degree lateral position, so there will be less pressure on the bony prominences, reducing the chance of the pressure source. Pressure source once if it starts once it's they need to be dressed daily. Uh, healthy pressure source, there is no need of application of any kind of medication, just cleaning the area surrounding the pressure source with betadine solution and the wound itself with normal saline will help. If the uh, grade of the pressure source becomes three or four, the th first thing is to remove any dead tissue that is there. Use certain ointments that will loosen the thick, thickened or dead tissue or scab tissue. Go for a sharp debridement using a scalp, scalpel. And sometimes we, it has been seen that vacuum therapy is helpful in reducing the pressure source. Whenever we speak about pressure sore or whenever we grade a pressure sore, we should always keep in mind that a grade three or grade four pressure sore will never become grade two or grade one pressure sore. Because once the sore starts or the wound starts healing, the com normal composition of the wound changes. So we can never say that a grade four pressure sore is becoming grade three or grade three pressure sore is becoming grade two. The best way to report a pressure sore is grade three or grade four pressure sore, which is healing. Patients who have a very deep pressure sore of grade four or which is not, which cannot be graded, sometimes they need to undergo surgery, a flap surgery and all, to, for proper healing of the pressure sore. Now we come to respiratory tract infection. As we spoke that people who are in bed for a long time, who have a weak, very weak cough reflex, they are always at the risk of contacting a lower respiratory tract infection, more commonly in the hospital setting, because they are not able to mobilize their secretions. They are lying in a certain position for a longer time. So secretions tend to pool up in the dependent parts of the lungs. So it's always required that the patient position be changed regularly they should receive proper chest therapy and some along with the assisted cuff. Then we have a UTI, as I said, that a lot of stroke patients have an indwelling catheter, which is always a risk factor for urinary tract infections. So certain protocols have to be followed to, re to reduce the chance of UTI, like taking adequate amount of liquids or water, maintaining proper perineal hygiene, Care should be taken while changing or putting in the catheter to reduce and uh, sterile measures should be used while changing the catheter. Then we have uh, spasticity and contractures. Now, spasticity is very commonly seen in all the stroke patients. And as I told that spasticity is basically the increased tone, which will depend upon the velocity of the movement. So the 
it's very difficult to prevent spasticity. The best way is to prevent deformities and contractures. Generally, we should start with positioning of the body parts on the bed. And that has to be taught to all the rehab staff, the rehab nurses, the physiotherapist, the doctor. Everybody should know how to position the limbs in, on the, of the patients on the bed. As I already spoke, that it is the tendency of our upper limbs to go into a flexor synergy and the lower limbs into a extensor synergy. So that's why it would be good to start with proper positioning of the limbs in the body in such a way so that the synergy pattern is broken first. Second thing is regular stretchings of the different joints. Third is some oral medications. And at last, obviously, injection, Botox injection. Now, when we speak of oral medications, a number of medications are used, but we should always keep in mind that most of the medications won't work so well on the upper limbs. Most of the medications work on the lower limbs. 